Um, for folks who are new to the coalition, just so you have a sense of where we're coming from, uh, the Sites of Conscience are a network of more than 300 members in more than 65 countries around the world um, who all come together because we believe that our historic sites have critical roles to play in helping us build more just and humane futures. Um, lots of ways to get connected with us. I can't remember, I, we might have some academic affiliates on the call, right? Um, people from all over can connect with us in a range of ways and we would love to. Um, Ella's on the call, Linda's on the call, I'm here um, and we'll, we'll figure out ways to chat. All right, let's talk about stories and narratives a little bit. Yeah, let's do it. All right, first thing that I want to start with is a quote from Barbara Hardy. Right? Um, we're museum people, we're historic site people. So often we think of first about stuff, we think about facts, we think about details. Um, and I really love the way that Barbara Hardy summed this up. Right, where she said, we dream in narrative, we daydream in narrative, remember, anticipate, hope, despair, believe, doubt, plan, revise, criticize, construct, gossip, learn, hate, and love by narrative. In order really to live, we make up stories about ourselves and others, about the personal as well as the social past and future. Right, We live in narrative. And so when we think about how people are moving through the world, um, when we think about who people are, um, how they make sense of the world, how they relate to other people, we have to think in terms of narrative. Um, so often we want to just step back to those forensic facts and they matter, right? But people are operating through narrative. And so as we start to think about this and we start to think about challenging narratives of control, that's not just saying, oh, these narratives are someplace out in the world, right? But these are living inside of the people who we're talking to. Okay. Um, here's a nice example of how we start to internalize that and it's, it's external to us. And this is the simplest of examples. It comes from uh, uh, Patrick Rainsborough and Doyle Cannon use this in their wonderful book, Reimagining Change. And they ask the question and as they are talking about narratives and if you're looking for people who are thinking about um, kind of reimagining and making narrative change, that's a great source. And they ask the question, what's a continent? <laughs> and as third grade students around the world will answer, right? A large landmass surrounded by a body of water, right? And that's sort of all sorts of questions about why the Philippines get counted, right? What do, what do we make of that and all their island nations? And there's some like shitty areas and like, sure, what gets really thin there between North and South America, we'll like, we'll give that one a pass. But there's like a big obvious exception to it, right? Europe, what the heck's going on, right? And so we are, able to answer a question. Narratives shape the way we look at evidence in the world, right? We want to think that humans start with um, the facts and then we come to all of our conclusions from there. Not always the case. Quite often we start with the narratives and the beliefs that we hold inside of ourselves and then we pay attention to or ignore the facts that are outside that, that um, right, we pay attention to the facts that confirm those narratives and we ignore the facts that, that challenge those narratives, right? And we're very comfortable living with something like, oh yes, I have a good definition of what a continent is. And I've got a set of stories that are in my head about that. Um, and even though that definition does not live, you know, match up with observed reality, I can still operate out of it, right? And that sense of what that definition though actually does have big impacts on the world because it starts to structure how we think about who matters and what's special and how we categorize all these people in the world, all right? So right, narrative structures are informing the way we process the world. Right? Um, another person think of, another way of, of saying this, um, uh, this is from Will Starr, uh, wrote a book called The Unpersuadables. Um, facts matter, but we have to remember that people live stories, not facts, okay? So as we start to think about um, engaging with 
con narratives of control. These are about narratives, right? This is not typically arguments over facts. These are arguments about narrative. And to take this uh, kind of a step deeper on terms of what's happening inside of people, we've got lots of different narratives, right? And uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of thinking about this, but um, just imagine in your head that we've got a spectrum of narratives from ones that are like tenuously held to ones that are really deeply held. Right? And the ones that are really deeply held tend to be ones that are about our identity, who we are, what groups we belong to, how we conceive of ourselves in the world and how we um, think about uh, ourselves in relation to others. Okay. Um, and there's a real challenge when we try and start to sh interact with those narratives, right? Those deep narratives of identity, those are often the ones where this kind of control is most, is most rooted. Um, and that's that our brains don't, <laughs> our brains do a funny thing. We have a really hard time. Our brains react in very much the same way to a physical threat as they do to a threat between to um, an aspect of our identity, right? A narrative of our identity, right? So our brains cannot tell the difference between being attacked by a bear and having some deeply held aspect of our identity attacked. They feel the same to us and our brains and our bodies then react in the same ways, right? Those same kinds of stress responses, the same efforts to protect ourselves um, uh, start to activate. This makes it, amongst other things, really hard to start changing um, those narratives. Um, and I'm sorry, I left the citation for Will Starr on this page. That's not the right citation for this page. I'll have to pull that um, from elsewhere, um, right? There's a whole world of people who think about this, social psych people, neuroscience people who, who dive into this. Um, but I think this is kind of a key concept to hold in our heads that uh, those identity pieces, it, it's not gonna respond to just facts. Right? Those facts matter. We want to live by facts where we can, right? but just throwing facts at something is, is not going to um, change it. And it might spark reactions that are actually really hard for people to then navigate around. Right? So um, setting up a challenge here, right? it's, it's not easy to change these underlying ideas. Um, in some ways, that's not a terrible thing. If we all walk down the street and every new piece of information we saw caused us to completely change our identity, it would be real tough being a human, right? So these things are sticky um, for good reasons too. But um, so not surprisingly though, as we think about trying to make change with some of these really closely held narratives, um, the answer is going to be different narratives. Right? that we're gonna answer stories with stories. Stories are the counterpoint, right? New stories that we can tell unlock stories from other people. Um, and so this is uh, stories and it's not accidental. There's a couple of key things that happen when we tell people stories and we immerse them in narrative that help us start to make change more likely and more possible. Right? And so this is coming from Melanie Green at UNC, uh, University of North Carolina, sorry. Um, and she talks about how when we, hear, when we get immersed in a story, we let our guard down, right? If we're going along with the flow of a story, we are less likely to argue, we are less likely to be skeptical, um, in part because it would disrupt the pleasure of the story that, that we're a part of, okay? Um, and so we are more likely to be able to take in information and perspectives through narrative format without having our brains start to do all the interrupt and resist and fight um, kind of responses. Um, a second piece is that we identify and connect with characters um, who we might struggle uh, to, to make that connection with in other settings. Right? They become known friends who we trust. This is a really big point because when we um, 
when we think about what we're willing to, who we're willing to let deep into us and start to help us make change around narratives and not, um, trust is central and key to that. There's a, who we trust, we will, we will receive information from people we trust differently than people we don't, right? And through a story, characters and their life experiences become trusted references for us. Um, we can build emotional connections and activate those emotions to help us think about what happens next, whether that's right anger, fear, love, right? All those things can be about um, activating upcoming uh, emotions. And the other thing is that we, our brains, we encode stories as near real, right? We know that they're not exactly real, but our brains kind of don't care. They're like, yeah, that's real enough. We're going to do that. Um, right. And, uh, good enough for me. Um, and because it's near real, um, we can be deeply impacted by these as well. It gives us an opportunity to have all these other experiences. Um, not every story does this. Um, so as we then start to think about who we are as storytellers, right. I'm not going to try and become, uh, English department here, right? Or like, yes, we must all, you know, I'm going to teach you to be the world's best playwrights. Um, there's lots of folks who think about that and do a really good job of trying to talk about that. Um, we do see three things that need to happen, again, from uh, Melanie Green's work, um, to help, pe to have people uh, become immersed in these, right? Um, and she talks about it as transportation, that moment when we're transported into another world. My uh, high school film teacher talked about it as the magic chair where you forget you're in the chair and you become part of the story. Um, so uh, it requires intellectual focus and engagement. So we've engaged somebody's intellect. It requires emotional connection and engagement. So their emotions are being linked to the story and are being activated. And the last is mental picturing. We have to get people to the place where they are playing this out inside of their head, either because they're reading it and they're playing it out, they're hearing it and they're playing it out. You know, they're seeing the movie pictures and are, and that's that's in their head now, and that's how they're playing it out. Okay. So we want to tell stories that do those three things. And if we do that, we have a chance of starting to access those deep underlying narratives that um, are close to people's identity and are most likely to be holding them back from being able to make a particular kind of change. Okay. All right, last point that I'm gonna share with you all today um, on all of this is um, what we then can think about. So, Right, obviously not all stories, even if they're transporting stories are going to have the kind of impact that we wanna see moving the world towards right, greater justice, greater humanity. Um, and so as we think about the stories that we tell, four things that we can do, four places we can look to think about trying to shape the narrative of this story that we're telling that's activating emotion, activating intellect, activating, um, uh, mental imaging, um, four places to look to think about, okay, how can I intentionally craft this narrative to give people new perspectives and to help it challenge whatever power structures an individual may be living in, okay? And so those are voice, who does the talking in a story, right? Where's the perspective of the story from? Right? And we talk, we talk about that all the time in history. What happens if we switch the story of the landing of the Mayflower and the pilgrims. We can tell it from the pilgrims point of view. We can tell it from the Wampanoag point of view, right? Looks pretty different, okay? Um, centrality is about who the spotlight shines on in any one of those stories, okay? This is, um, so right, example of that, when we tell that story, whether it's from the pilgrims point of view or from the Wampanoags point of view, um, are the pilgrims still the focus or actually are we focusing on somebody else? Okay. Who do we talk about as the center? Who, who do we care about? Um, 
how do we frame a story? And that's often geographic or temporal boundaries that we put on a story. Um, the example that came up a lot a year or so ago was the space race. And so if we start the, the narrative of the space race told in the US is often, um, oh, if we, um, uh, the space race starts in the late 50s with the Russian satellite Sputnik going up, then you get the great heroic speech by Kennedy. He dies, everyone's motivated. The US goes to the moon and wins and they're the heroes, right? If you just change the time frame from the late 50s to the late 60s and move that from the late 40s to the late 50s, it becomes a story not about going to the moon, but just about leaving the planet and getting somebody into orbit. And there the successful people and the heroes of the story are gonna be the Russians and the cosmonauts. So just changing the time frame is going to push us to change the narrative. Um, and the last one is agency. Right? So who has the ability to take action and who doesn't? Um, and we see that in two ways, uh, right? both agency given to people and agency withheld. Um, most commonly, we see that as right agency given to the powerful, agency withheld from the oppressed. Um, but they'll, that'll flip um, when we want to shield or protect uh, the powerful from the consequences of their actions or inactions will take away their agency or hide it in a story and uh, vice versa. Um, when we want to shift blame to the oppressed, um, we'll give them, make sure to highlight agency there. Personal responsibility. That's why there's income inequality in the world because people are personally in irresponsible. Never mind the giant systems over here. This tends to be where we get the most fighting in narratives and historical narratives. And we can kind of talk about that another day. But um, when we think about trying to craft narratives that challenge um, existing power structures, these are four places we look and say, ah, how can we shift what's a what people are expecting to hear a little bit um, and use one of these to reframe them. All right. So that's what, that's what I've got to share with you this morning or this afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, just a little bit thinking about um, uh, some of the narratives that we run into. So I wanna pause here and say, how's this resonating? What makes sense about this? What's challenging about this? What are some of the narratives that you're struggling to change where you are? Feel free to use the chat box. We can unmute. I know I laid a lot out in a small period of time. Does this feel worrying to you? Does this feel hopeful to you? Uh, if I can jump in, I learned a lot that I have not ever really had to grapple with when talking about power narratives, which um, I'm kind of upset about because I feel like I've focused a lot on this in my work. Um, but one thing that I know I really struggle with trying to this conversation about stories is that there is resistance to even find stories outside of one's own experience. Um, and often we get siloed into stories and narratives with individuals or experiences, like if we go to a museum and it's the same story, it just looks slightly different. Um, and so I don't know, maybe this is better to pose as a question, but especially when confronting issues of, of identity or challenging deep held ideologies and identity beliefs, how do you take that first step to engage with stories that look completely different from your own? Like what's that, what's that incentive? Like I know I have the, the interest in it, because of my background and my experiences, but 
but how do you how do you compel someone whose experiences are completely um, kind of clear cut and dry and always the same to think outside of their own narrative? A wonderful question, which I would throw to everybody else here. How do we make that first step happen? Where have you seen that be successful? What do you think are the elements of that first step of curiosity of getting people to be able to start to engage? Is it perhaps in your example about changing the timeline to include other people and events in with that challenge to open it up for new interpretation for different programming? So maybe that could be the nucleus for generating change and bringing um, other people into the, the discussion um, by just saying, you know, we're, we're going to expand our programming. And by looking at our timeline and changing it, we're going to include these other individuals and then reach out to the community and see how you could enhance on that interrelationship. It's a good idea. I also know that a bunch of you are being quiet this morning, but I know this is work you have personally done. <laughs> what do you all think? So Braden, I have one thing that I kind of am always reminded of, uh, and it's actually pretty easy to begin this process, is to physically go somewhere that you are uncomfortable with, where people have different stories. There's parts of everybody's community, you know, we have our own places, we go for coffee or whatever, to begin to hear other stories, I think you have to physically think about how you're gonna be in a place where other people are comfortable, which probably is not your museum, may not be your museum. So that's my advice. Yeah. And that's a part of your personal practice that I respect. As Brayden <laughs> knows, I'll go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, like from Sham, right, taking groups on trips, seeing something new and hear from people in those locations, for sure. Um, so a really interesting element of what's in there that you're talking about for Sham and that, Edward, you were starting to lay out a little bit that I think about is about trust. And as we ask people to go someplace new, they need to go there with somebody that they trust right, that there's going to be, there's some sort of bridge, right, hey, as we go there, there's going to be people there you trust, and you're traveling there with people you trust, right, so we're all on the bus with other people, and we're going to go have this experience, right, so I trust, and there's somebody who's the guide who I trust who's taking me there and can kind of help bridge it, and there's so there's like that idea of as this new information comes in, it's coming from someplace that I have trust with. Um, having trust, having those relationships is critical to what, um, uh, what we're gonna process. We're gonna talk about this on another um, short coming up pretty soon where we're gonna talk about polarization and um, uh, partisanship. Um, the, just to preview one of the slides you'll see there, uh, our brains actually react differently to information from in-group members versus out-group members. The way we, the parts of our brain that process that, um, are different aspects of it, right? And so as we try and start to learn about out-group members, having some in-group members along the way to help us do that is really critical. Um, 
All right. So we try and keep these short, um, to keep us from diving too far down any particular rabbit hole any day. And because you all have a lot of work to do. Um, but uh, really appreciative of you all spending time um, with us today. Um, oh yeah. Love it, right? Museum of Free Dairy having ex-British soldiers in, right? Really interesting. And how does that connection first start? And then where can you go with that um, as people start to do that? Um, a wonderful number. Um, all right, so we're gonna leave it there. Uh, I can see that the thoughts are like slowly, they're on the slow simmer today. That's great. Um, I keep them coming. We're always happy to have this conversation. Like I said, the webinar shorts are gonna continue and we'll keep kind of trying to give you um, a few entry points for everybody who's joining us later on recording. Um, thanks for making time for this later on. Hopefully you're thinking along with everybody here. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all. Actually, let me share a, a screenshot of some upcoming things. Hang on, <laughs> we've got that. Where are they? Oh, I don't, I didn't put together our, um, our upcoming webinars stuff, but we've got some good ones coming. Linda, you have one soon, right? Did she leave? She probably had to run to a thing. We've got good stuff. It's on the website. We're doing one on polarization coming up. Hope you can all make it. And uh, thanks for hanging out today.